Well, hello and welcome to uh, the Lincoln Road Chapel YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us. The gift of God is the subject today. Christmas is on the way. I still enjoy receiving presents. Maybe this is a little childish. I, I'm talking about not just the, the, what the gift is, which hopefully is going to be helpful and interesting or whatever, but uh, the actual process. Of course, I've at that age, eh, never mind what age, um, but that age where it, people say, well, what do you want? Rather than just trying to guess, you know, the man who has everything or very little, really. I, I, I suppose if I could ask, I would ask for a little bit of common sense, perhaps, or a memory especially would be wonderful. So far in vain have I desired such gifts. But um, the, I was going to say the surprise is nice. Interestingly enough, well, interestingly enough to me, um, I've sometimes chosen a gift, then I've received it, unwrapped it. Oh, how did you know? You told us, but I'd forgotten they told us, which is which is which is nice. It's one of the few benefits of having a bad memory. Um, on balance, good to have uh, a good memory. However, the gift of God, which, as we'll see, is eternal life, could not possibly. Be, have been imagined beforehand. The gift of God is God. A dead God. God who cannot die. Dying to become my sin. And then alive to give me the benefits of that life. Well, it, the Bible word or the word we translate the Bible word from is, is mystery. Meaning that which could not be known before, but now is made absolutely known. The gift of God is eternal life. Now, in response to that gift, we give ourselves, but we can't earn it. That's the whole point. It has to be a gift. Well, um, and, and more than that, not only is our giving ourselves to God, yes, which is absolutely necessary, uh, necessary, it is necessary, but also it's part of the gift that I'm able to do that and then enter into relationship with him and know him as father, share everything, share his mind and plans. And that is life, relationship and, and the nature of the living God. It becomes mine. These things are amazing. And this gift of God, the fact that it's a gift, that in no way is it a kind of a technique that I achieve through my own you know, some mental trick or something, nor my own efforts of being good and earning it. That's absolutely impossible. Well, that is a unique feature to Christianity. And because of that, we sing the first song now. We want to see Jesus lifted up. We want people to see him and to be drawn to him and to receive this gift of life. See Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see. We want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward, little by little taking ground. Every prayer a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down.
programme with James Tour and Lee Cronin, debating the origin of life. And because scientists are nowhere near creating life in the lab, even though they like to think that otherwise, Lee Cronin was trying to say that no one really knows what life is. Well, I'm afraid he's wrong. The first verse of the Bible states, In the beginning, that's time, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. And a creator always has the right of ownership. So God owns all that he has made, including us. John 10.10 quotes Jesus as saying, I am come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Genesis also tells us that God created Adam, the first male, from the elements needed from matter, i.e. dust from the earth. Once Adam's body was complete, God breathed his spirit into him. And at that point, Adam became a living soul. Totally unique from the animal kingdom. Animals don't have souls, which is why, no matter how intelligent a species may be, they have no form of worship. All humanity worships, whether it's a famous person, wealth, career, or God himself. Humans live as worshippers. Animals live to propagate. Luke 23, 43 explains, when Jesus hung on the cross, one of the criminals being crucified with him in the throes of death turned to Jesus. Jesus responded by promising him life in paradise. That criminal had done diddly squat to earn his salvation. So we can see God is the creator of life. Jesus came to give abundant life. And through his death and resurrection, he has promised future life in paradise to all who turn to him. So my conclusion is that life cannot be manufactured or earned. It is and always will be a wonderful gift from a wonderful God. Thanks for listening. Why eternal life must be a gift. Eternal life must be a gift because eternal life cannot be earned by efforts, by human efforts, by rituals, or superstitions. Because all humans are fallible, we are all capable, we are all born with the capability of sinning, we are all capable of sinning, and we have all sinned one way or another. And so, this means, if we look at Luke chapter 5, verse 32, it says, so Christ says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this means, this applies to everyone, since all humans are fallible. If we look at Luke chapter 5 verse 24, this is pertaining to the story of the man of the palsy, who was then healed, it says, But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. So that means we can, as we repent in Christ, our sins are forgiven through him. Well now, our Bible reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, beginning at verse 15. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, verse 23. Sorry it's me reading, having opened the meeting and then later speaking. I did ask others, but I had notably little success in getting others, uh, some others anyway, to take part. Glad for those, grateful for those who have done so. Um, right, so Romans chapter 6 from verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? No way. Don't you know that to whom you yield yourselves, servants or slaves, to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked, 
you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness to holiness. For when you were the servant of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. There's a place where the street shines with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there, we can live there beyond time. Because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your of November 2023. The gift of God is the topic uh, today. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death, but that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One of the first verses I ever committed to memory as a young Christian Death, I'm talking about spiritual death, not physical death, which is part of the, the, the story here. But I'm going to talk about spiritual death, which is being cut off from God, who is uh, life. So the wages, that which we earn, is death. We deserve that. But the gift that we don't deserve, just the gift of grace because of the kindness and love of God, 
is eternal life. As I say, um, well, what is it? What is the gift? Well, that's obviously eternal life. The means to that, we'll discover even that is a gift. And then thirdly, to justify the fact that the means to the gift of God is itself a gift. <laughs> so we'll look at that. So firstly, what is it? The gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only God has eternal life. Well, God is eternal life. But, but when we're thinking of it as a gift, it's more specifically understood as in his son. Um, John 3, 16, again, possibly the most well-known verse in the Bible. I, I don't even remember committing it to memory. It just seemed to have been quoted so often. Maybe I did, I don't know. For God so loved the world that he gave, gave, it's a gift, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life, the life of God himself. Again, John's gospel at the beginning of the first, uh, the, the, the full verse of the first chapter, in him was life. This is very important because it relates to how we can have this life. That's the point. So in John, again, it's the letter, this time the letter of John, but the writings of John. Uh, chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, John says, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. He's talking to Christians, those who have believed on Christ. And this life is in his son. It's not that it was sort of put there, that the son has life in himself. He is God. But it, it means that there's life that we can obtain in him. He came down from heaven and brought us life. And what he did on earth, he does individually to us as we trust him. This life is in, from our point of view, in his son. Of course, it's in his son anyway. He that has the son has life. He that's received the gift of God, which is eternal life. And he that has not the son of God doesn't have life. I mean, that's certainly, that's um, obvious. So it, it's talking about our access to it, the gift of God. Um, I'm going to read you again. It's the writings of John, the prayer of the Lord Jesus, uh, just before he died, near the beginning of it. I'm going to read you uh, John chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. Jesus is praying. He says, as you have given him, talking about himself here, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. There's no natural means, power over all flesh. No natural thing or person or being that can stop him giving life. That he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal. This is what it is. That they might know you. Be in touch with you. Have no barrier between them and you. In other words, have a relationship. The only true God does... Uh, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Not that Jesus Christ is inferior. He is also the true God, but you're the only true God as opposed to idols and others. There is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible teaches. So, so it's not just that the life is in God. It's as we interact with him and come to receive Christ, God becomes our father and we have this relationship. Therefore, we do something useful and become satisfied so that we're doing what God is doing and wants to do in us and wants us to do. All that really is the same thing. So that our occupation is perfect and therefore our satisfaction, we're as satisfied as God is because his accomplishments become ours and we enter in to that way of working. We realise our potential and that is life, the life of God. 
So it's not just as something that exists in an eternal way, but it's a quality of life, a, a, an enjoyment of entering into that and into relationship with him. As it puts it in the old hymn, my Christ, he is the tree of life that in God's Eden grows. We were barred from life because of man's sin, so he could not take from the tree of life, which was in Eden, the, the garden of God. He was barred, he was sent out, an angel was put in every way uh, to keep him from it, um, a flaming sword so that he couldn't approach. Well, that tree of life appears again in the book of the Revelation in the holy city, a picture of the church that comes down from heaven with all the doors open, three doors or three gates open each way, coming down to where we are, inviting people to come in. The river of life comes out, but it swirls around the tree of life, which is in the city which we can freely go into. In other words, it, 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 when it says the gift of life, it's, it, it's the life of God that we can access, come to, receive. That's what it is, the gift of God. And then the means to it, it's repentance and faith, but that's also a gift. Now, repentance, uh, it means turning from all that I think, my ways, my sin, my evil, to God and his ways, his methods, his means of salvation, his means of saving me, his will for my life, the whole lot to righteousness, purity, hope, wonder, joy, and so on, obedience to him. That's all in repentance. But note this, in, jo in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, um, the context is that uh, some Jews that believed went with Peter, or, or, or rather they heard what Peter had said about a Jewish uh, uh, Cornelius who was a Gentile who'd received the gospel. They knew this had happened because they'd received the power gift of the Holy Spirit. But when Peter descri uh, described this, this is what they said. When they heard these things, they held their peace, they stopped the objections they had and glorified God saying, then has God also to the Gentiles, the non-Jews granted repentance to life that's how you have life you turn from your way to God but it's it's a gift not only in the sense of there's now an opportunity for Gentiles people who are not Jews to receive the gospel as well which of course is 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 true that's it. the gospel is for everybody but not only that but the actual ability the actual turning from, from sin and the things that grip me, the things that I'm interested in and the limitations and the ignorance and the, the, the power of evil, the power of the evil one that, that would bind me and keep me, that's in my very nature, the power to turn the ability is a gift. Thank God it's a gift from God. Uh, but it's not only the... the um, the, 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 the repentance but faith that faith is trusting Christ entirely him he's the one who can save he's the one who's died for my sins the perfect one who did all of the will of God and didn't need to die I'm talking about spiritually now although it was physically as well uh, but he did for me and when I look at him I see my sins on him so I'm free justified made righteous and, and so on there's more to it than that but um that's faith. And I just trust him. That's I put my faith entirely and only in him and I'm saved. But even that ability or that giving of my trust, committing my whole future and life, my eternal well-being to him, saying, well, I'm going to do what you want now. I trust you. That is a gift. Now, let me read to you Ephesians chapter two. Again, these are very well known. Verses, verses 8 to 10. Paul says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's, you're saved from sin and misery and death to life. It's, it's grace. It's something you could not have achieved on your own. You don't deserve it. It's just a gift. It's grace. 
By grace are you saved, through faith, by trusting. And that, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Even that faith to trust in is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not that you could do it um, yourself. You couldn't please God sufficiently by obeying him to be saved. It's impossible. Not of works, not of your ability, your works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Two good works, to works that are not the works of the law by my own effort that I that have that fail and are miserable and so on, but that he he's he's done something in me that enables me to, to do the works that it says here he's from 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 the councils of eternity have worked out or ordained that I should work it walk in them. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, two good works which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So, so that miracle of God that enables me to do things that I could never do before by his grace and power, the ability to trust him to do that is a gift. Somebody may object to that and say, well, surely it's down to us to repent. Um, it's We've got to trust him, yes. Absolutely true. But in doing that, we discover that God is doing it in us. Not only doing it, but he's given us the inclination, the will to do it. Let me quote you Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. You have to look at the context. It's a wonderful context, but I'm not wrenching this out of context when I quote it now. It is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, that which pleases him. And since he's all love and wants the best for you and, and, and in the best way, well, we, we, we can trust him. It, it will be right. And But it, even my will to want that, it's kind of his will. He's not forcing me, but he's working in me so that my will is his. His is mine in this respect. Not only to want it, but to actually do it, to will and to do of his good pleasure. So that the means, repentance and faith, to, to obtain the gift of eternal life is itself a gift. And finally, just to justify that fact that the means are uh, themselves are gifts of God. Um, Let's put it like this. It's necessary for the repentance of faith to be my actions. They must be. I must turn logically from what is, is deathly and horrible and disgusting to God. It becomes disgusting to me. And I must turn from all sin and all that's wrong, all my methods and thinking to his. Uh, but I must do that. Of course I must. Otherwise, he's kind of forcing me. Well, that's not really me then, is it? Similarly, I must trust him. I can't be forced into trusting someone if he's making me. Say you trust me or not. Well, I, I, who am I? Am I going to trust a God who does that? Who's On the contrary, I, whatever I say under duress, it's not what I mean. So it's necessary for it to be my action but it's also necessary for it to be God's action in me. Because any repentance I engage in is not going to be perfect or total. There'll be a part of my heart that still wants things that are bad and so on. Um, and how could I ever be confident that my repentance was in, entire or that I am trusting him entirely and that there's not some residual <coughs> Trust in myself or something else or some bit of superstition that I haven't got rid of yet or haven't even understood is wrong yet. Um, yet so, so that even my cooperation with God in turning, repenting from all that's wrong and putting my trust in him, if, if, if that's just down to me without his grace and help, it's going to fail. 
And it won't work either if it's just oh, a bit of mine and a bit of his. It, it has to be all of his, and yet I must be doing it. Now, if you can understand that, you'll be the, probably the first one in history. But it, it means this, that God's power and grace overrules, inspires and, and overrules all the failings in mine. But it doesn't obliterate mine. It inspires mine. Now, if I've put that perfectly, I'll probably be the first one in history. But it must be my action to repent and, and trust Christ. But it must be his. And it is his. And he's behind it all. So that the glory, the credit all goes to him. And that means, and this also justifies the means in this way, it means that I can be assured. I can have absolute confidence. My soul, as David said in Psalm 34, can make a boast but in the Lord, I have perfect peace because I'm trusting his work, his work that he's done. He died on the cross. And when he, right at the end of that, he said, accomplished, finished, done. He, the sinless one, had become the perfect atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world because he took the sin of the world, having been cut off from his father. Done. We speak of the finished work of Christ on the cross. But it's what he's accomplishing. Because he, he went up then, having uh, died, he rose from the dead, went back up into heaven. He sat down on the to, to indicate that he'd finished the work on earth. He'd finished, but he's there praying, interceding, sending help to us, giving us grace coming to live in us and with us through the Holy Spirit that he sends. In other words, he's keeping us now. We're kept by the power of God. So he's accomplishing it. I continue to trust him. I continue to turn from any slips that I make or new information that I receive from him. Oh, I see. Yes, I turn and I agree with that. I go along with that. That's his work in me too. So I can have peace and he will finally <clears throat> accomplish it. He will finish the work. What he's done on the cross and said finished, he will then look at me and every other Christian and indeed in the end, the whole of the universe and say it's done, it's finished. Everything, everybody has benefited. All those who trusted me have benefited. Uh, from my work. So I'm putting my trust in what he has done, what he is doing and what he will do. And I'm turning from all my ways and thoughts and sin to trust what he has done, is doing and will do. And therefore I have perfect peace, peace, perfect peace in this poor world, this, this dreadful world, this hopeless world of sin. The gift of God is eternal life. And you trusting him, you can do it. You can turn to him, whatever the grip of sin seems to be, because it will be him doing it in you. Isn't that wonderful? So that all the glory is, is of him. He, he, it's for him, it's from him. He is in all things working and, and all the glory is his. That's how we find our peace because we're not, we don't have to and we mustn't and we can't trust ourselves. It will get us nowhere. Turn to him now. Trust him for his gift. He gives, the gift is given, just needs to be received. <laughs> the gift of God is eternal life. But it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What a gift of grace is Jesus my My joy, my right.
righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, if the Lord will and Tara, I'm going to speak about the fact that everything that happens to us, in fact, everything that happens, good and bad, is his gift to enable us to receive and benefit from the gift of God, which is, of course, eternal life. Let's pray together. We thank you, our God, that this gift, you make it plain to us that it is just a gift. You 
are the gift of God, our Lord Jesus. And by grace, we receive you. We say thank you. Following you is also your gift to us. And we can trust you that we may able be able to follow you now and forever. Thank you for that. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with everyone who has turned to Jesus and has trusted and is trusting Jesus and with God's people everywhere now and until that same Jesus comes to return to finish what he has started. Amen.